Good morning. It is good to have you with us on this Sunday morning. This is Cowan Sunday. It's our emphasis on camping ministry at Cowan that begins in just a few short weeks. And there are preparatory weekends that are been planned, and you can see some of those announcements downstairs. As far as our music this morning, we're going to be doing some songs from Cowan. And Brian Angus and his wife came up from uh, Summersville. Brian is one of the campfire song leaders. And so he's come to lead us in our songs today, so the song's a little different. But you can learn them and you can sing them, and so I hope you will. The words will be up on the screen. Uh, some of them are familiar, some may not be, but I hope that you'll engage as we gather here. And those that are watching online, we welcome you on this uh, Sunday morning as we celebrate the special ministry at Camp Cowan. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, and Camp Cowan. Uh, Uncle Gene and that Dixie were Camp Cowan for many, many years, so I spent winters and summers and uh, all my growing up life at camp. And summer of 75, I got a job on staff, and I was uh, 19 years old, a, uh, getting ready to start my junior year in college, and Camp Cowan means a lot to me because I was raised in church. And I thought I was a Christian, I was baptized, and I was hiding in a counselor hunt that summer and with a pretty girl from Charleston, Debbie Jones. If you know her, then tell her I'd like to talk to her sometime. Uh, because I was hiding with her in a counselor hunt, and she said, what does it mean to be a Christian? I thought she wanted to know. I'd been a Christian all my life. I was on staff. So I told her this, and this is exactly what I said. It's someone who goes to church, is kind to old ladies, and does not kick dogs. She said, well, those are things that Christians do, but that doesn't make you a Christian. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit convicted me. I'd never been convicted before in my whole life. But the Holy Spirit convicted me, and I stuttered, and I said, it, 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 it doesn't, what, 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 what does? She said, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I, we're outside, and I said, uh, God's up there. I don't understand. God's up there. 
And I'm down, how, 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 how can you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I don't, what are you talking about? I never heard of such a thing. He says, you need to ask him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Would you like to do that? And I got stuck in the woods with Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul, and she was, God was using her in a mighty way, and I don't know if she realized just how much God used her in that moment. Would you like to ask Jesus into your heart? And I said, no, I would not. Oh, yeah, the plot thickens here, doesn't it? And I walked away, and she told Pepper Harrison on me. Pepper was the camp pastor that week. And I'm getting ready to play ping pong with the boys there on the camp porch, and Pepper comes and sits down beside me. And he starts taking me through Romans Road of Salvation. And he's going through this, and it's, it's like I'm a wild animal with a cage coming on me. And I thought, man, i got to get away from him. And just the pressure and the conviction was all over me. Finally, he said, would you like to ask Jesus into your heart? And I said, no, I would not. And I walked away. And when I got 15, 20 yards from him, I thought, man, you are so dumb. What in the world is wrong with you? Why in the world didn't you ask, say yes? So for the first time in my life, I laid down in bed that night and said, God, please don't let me die and go to hell. Give me one more chance. You know, usually when you turn someone down, they'll never come back again, you know, because their feelings are hurt. And, and when morning came, I was happy. I hadn't died and gone to hell. And that evening, I hung around that phone booth, that red phone booth that's on the porch. That's where I gave my heart to Jesus. I hung around that red phone booth, hoping that Pepper would show up again. And he did, and he sat down with me and Started taking me through Romans Road and all this stuff again and answering questions and well, that pressure was on me. Would you like to ask Jesus into your heart? And I said, no, I would not. And I walked away again. So three times I turned Jesus down. But this, this conviction was all over me. And once again, I thought, you're about the stupidest person in the whole world. What in the world is wrong with you? And I prayed, God, give me one more chance. I promise if you do this. So the next evening, Pepper come and talk to me again and ask Jesus. And ever since then, I've had this personal relationship with Christ. And it's, been, it's been 48 years, summer 75. And I immediately, I had a, had a couple guys in college that were chasing me around the dorms, White Golf and Balboa. Give your heart to Jesus. They catch me in the bathroom. And I said, okay, I go to church, I'm fine. And I thought I was. There was I thought I was saved. I mean, I'd been to church all my life, baptized and all that stuff. And I was going up to clean the cabins, and I heard someone call my name. He said, hey, Brian. I turned around and looked, and it's Dwight, the guy from the college that had been hounding me and chasing me all over the place. I said, Dwight, what are you doing here? He said, I was working in southern West Virginia in a missions project, and I heard you got saved. And I volunteered to bring some kids to camp so I could talk to you. He said, when you get to campus this fall, I want you to get involved with campus ministry with us. So I got involved with InterVarsity. And uh, began playing music for them. I'd been playing the 60s and 70s rock stuff and began playing music with them. And this is where I ran into this song, Blind Man. And as far as I know, Mike George and I were the first people at Camp Cowan to use guitars, campfire. Up to that point, it was all just vocal. Uh, so this is one of them. Stand up and join with me. If you want to stand up or sit, whatever. Blind man to sit by the road and he cried. Blind man sit by the road and he cried. Blind man sit by the road and he cried. He cried, oh, 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 oh show me the way. Well, show me the way. Well, show me the way. Sit by the well and she cried. Woman, sit by the well and she cried. Woman, sit by the well and she cried. She cried, oh, oh, show me the way. Show me the way. Show me. We 
all sit by the road and we cry. We all sit by the road and we cry. We all sit by the road and we cry. We cry, oh, 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 show us the way. Well, show us the way. Well, show us the way. Jesus hung on the cross and he died. Jesus hung on the cross and he died. Jesus hung on the cross and he died. He cried, oh, 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 I am the way. rose from the dead he's alive Jesus rose from the dead he's alive Jesus rose from the dead he's alive he cried oh oh, oh I am the way I am the truth I am Way to get started. Y'all want the good news or the better news? All of it. The good news is, is it's Cowan Sunday. Yes. The better news is it's second Sunday lunch. And I love this. If you have not seen it, if you have not seen it, second Sunday lunch on the third Sunday, always my favorite, but second Sunday lunch on the third Sunday, sponsored by Little old church ladies and a couple of guys. Now that is, ah, I love that. Thank you all so much. Well, Cowan Sunday, and thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for coming to sing, to praise, to worship. It's going to be a lot of fun today. It's going to be a great, got a great sermon lined up, great music. It's going to be a wonderful worship, and then we're going to eat. Thank you for being here. For all of y'all out there, whenever, wherever you may be watching this, we welcome you as well. We know you're here with us, and we love you, and blessings to you. Um, so starting off with announcements, um, of course, we got second Sunday lunch today. This Tuesday, the Board of Servants and Trustees are meeting, so if you're on either of those, please be here on Tuesday the 18th. On Wednesday the 19th at 6.30 in the Great Room, Eric and Yuri Limke will be speaking on their intended mission work in Thailand. Um, that's going to take place at the normal Bible study in the Great Room downstairs. This coming Friday is family game night, so bring a game and snack to share on the 21st at 6.30. And next Saturday, Spaghetti Dinner, sponsored by Women's Choice at Emmanuel Baptist Church, $12 per dinner. Always food's always a win. This is spaghetti and supporting mamas and babies. It's a wonderful thing. Come out and help with that. And then looking forward in about two weeks, the Masters Trios concert in the Great Hall. Free concert, but I believe there's going to be barbecue as well. So we're, we're going to be eating a lot, and we're going to be eating good over the next few weeks. We are Baptists, are we not? That is a wonderful thing. So many great blessings, uh, wonderful things coming. And so... As we move forward, Brian, we thank you and your wife for being here today. Looking forward to seeing. It's great to have you, and I always like to point it out. My claim to fame is I may be the only one. I got beat up at Camp Cowan. So. But I always think I want to be very honest here for a second. Please do not undervalue the tools we have at Camp Cowan in Parchment Valley. I ask as a church, and I ask as a member of the Board of Shepherds, that we make an effort to support these, keep our kids going, support them as ministries, because these schools, many of our brother Christians throughout the United States do not have. Uh, I lean go back to old FDR. You know, the basis of the Civilian Conservation Corps was basically this, and his very kind of old-fashioned way. He thought some time out in the country would do some young men from the city some good. Um, and that's exactly how he said it. 
and Cowan on the Gully River. Cowan is a good old Scotch-Irish name. It's a beautiful camp. It's on the Gully. It's a wonderful program. So as much as we that, getting kids off the screens, out of town, into the Word of God, and into God's creation, the better off we'll be. It's a wonderful thing. And here's the why. Pastor's going to preach on this, but I'm going to Psalms. Psalms 127. Unless Yahweh builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless Yahweh watches the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early, that you sit out late, O oh, you who eat the bread of painful labors. For in this manner he gives sleep to his beloved. Behold, children are an inheritance of Yahweh. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with the enemy in the gates. Let us pray. Heavenly, gracious Father, we are humbled to come before you. We are humbled to come before your glory, come before you and your sovereign authority, and your guidance, and, and all that you've blessed us with and bestowed upon us. And we thank you, Father. We are very blessed to have Camp Cow, and we are very blessed to have the wonderful of time during the summer to work and to nurture and to help and to be involved if everything that goes and it is a challenge to make it run father god and we are thankful for them and we pray continually your blessings over them we pray father as we begin this summer that you are watching over the young folks as they go to Cowan. may they be safe may they learn may they grow in you may they continue to grow in that relationship Christ, may the Spirit be constantly at work in that place. May you constantly watch over them this summer, Father, and we are so thankful for you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there are many things that, that you guys can do for camp. Part of that's be a counselor and, and go serve. I'm doing three camps this summer. I'm doing junior one, junior high one, high school one, and uh, my wife is going to be the nurse at two of those camps. Uh, I have some grandkids there and some church kids there, and uh, but it's never too old to do that, okay? Stand up. You're going to like this one. <coughs> Well, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away and I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Well, just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a home on the hill you'll never end. I'll fly away and I'll fly away. Sun. I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Way beyond the Jesus as my Savior, you take him to. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him to. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him to. 
while he's calling you. And I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. And I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Give me oil in my lamp. I pray. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. And I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Ushers will come forward. I'll pray for our tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you for all the gifts, all you bestowed us and blessed us with financially. Pray, Father, for your continued grace, your continued blessings. We pray you take and use what we give back to glorify yourself and build your kingdom. In Christ Jesus' name we pray.
It is good to be with you this morning. I am thankful God has brought our paths together. As we get ready to start the sermon, I have four wonderful teenagers that are passing out a sheet of paper that looks like this. Everyone needs one. So if you do not have one in hand right now, if you would raise your hand so they can more quickly get out to everyone that needs to have one. Okay? Everybody needs, actually, this is my notes. Yours do not look like this. I'm sorry. This is what yours looks like. While they're passing that out, we'll be using that toward the end of the sermon, so have it handy. We have one up here. Crazy. Oops. You can hold on to the extras. I'll collect them afterward. Make sure you have one. All right. Top of that says what? Okay, about 60% of you. What's the top of it say? Okay, that's what we're going to be talking about for the next several months. This is called Faith Stories, the series that I want to try to focus on in the coming weeks. And what I want to do throughout these coming weeks is take different characters from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and for us to think just a little bit each Sunday about the faith story they have, about how God has worked in their life, or how Jesus Christ has touched and changed them, okay? And so for the foundation of this series, we want to look in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the Old Testament, fifth book of the Old Testament, the last book of the law, Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 4 through 9, then jumping down to the first part. It was a typo on my part that's been repeated in all the bulletins and everything. It says 12b, it's supposed to be 12a, which means the first part of the verse. Uh, and that was my error, my apologies to the staff who followed diligently with what I had printed, but uh, we'll be looking at the first phrase of verse 12. If you are able to stand, I'd invite you to stand as we read God's word together. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Go down to verse 12. Be careful and do not forget the Lord careful to not forget. May the Lord bless the reading and our hearing of his word. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these moments you've given us together. We thank you for your word. And Lord, in this time, help our minds to be able to be centered in you and upon you. Help the distractions of life and the words that often run in our minds to be quieted. So in these precious moments, we can see you and hear you. And Lord, that you may speak through your spirit into each of our hearts. Help us not to race ahead to the events that we think will happen later today or the days yet to come because we're not guaranteed of anything except this moment. And Lord, help us not to get caught in the yesterdays of life. Maybe it was great and wonderful. Maybe it was sad and sorrowful. Maybe it was just a mediocre day. Lord, I just pray that you would help us in these moments to be centered and to be open for your spirit to speak into each of our hearts and Lord, to stir us from the very depths of who we are. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Take these very simple words I prepared and permit them to be a means by which you speak to our hearts this day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The context for what we just read really backs up in the history. 
It goes back 40 years. It goes back when you have the Israelites, a couple million strong, brought out of bondage of Egypt, out into the plains, there near the Mount Sinai, where Moses led them, and God showed up. If you go back and read that in Exodus chapter 20, you see that when God comes and appears on the mountain, there is thunder and there is lightning and there is earthquakes. And God speaks. And Israel shakes in fear. They are scared to death because they have heard the voice of God. The one who physically is before them by day, a pillar of, of cl a cloud of smoke. By night, a pillar of fire. My words out here. They have heard him speak to them. And they are terrified. And they plead with Moses to go as an in-between. But he announces from the top of that mountain to all of his people... Those things we call what? The Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods except me, right? You shall bow down to no idols, make no idols of any image. You are not to take the name of God in vain. You are called to keep the Sabbath what? Holy. You're called to honor your father and your mother. You're called to not kill. You're called not to, to not commit adultery. You're called not to steal. You're called not to bear false witness, to lie, and not to covet anything. Right? Those are the foundations that's there. And God announced that to his people. And they shook in fear. And they pled with God and pled with Moses that Moses would be the go-between. That he would go and hear from God and relay it to them. And they promised, they promised that they would believe. But the 40 years in the desert proved their word shallow. Because on the time we come to Deuteronomy, we're at the end of the 40 years. And everyone that was of age that left Egypt has perished in the desert. It is the children and the children's children that are now before Moses. And as they're on the precipice of going into that promised land that God had told Abram would be his descendants, that Moses had brought their parents to that very place to look in and see what God was going to give, and they were afraid. And they, are, they spent 40 years learning how to trust God and how to have faith in God and how to leave behind all the distractions, idols, of the world that they had come out of, all that Egypt had offered, to be able to leave that in the past and to realize that God is our source every moment of every day. Amen? Hasn't changed, has it? But those 40 years... Was God trying and testing the hearts of Israel so that as they were ready to enter into that promised land, they would know. It wasn't a matter they thought or hoped, but they knew God is faithful. They knew God provided. They had had the manna from heaven six days a week, they had the water from the rock. Protection from enemies of all sorts. God had taught them. And now as they stand ready to enter into the promised land, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you go back to chapter 5, the Ten Commandments. Moses is once again stating, announcing to these people as they're about to enter into the promised land that God had brought them here and that God had these commands for them to follow. And the balance of Deuteronomy for the most part is the reiteration of all the instructions that come from these Ten Commandments for how we're supposed to live and follow God. So he's giving the law a second time to this new set of ears. Maybe some of the oldest ones were little children when the mountain quaked 
when the lightning and thunder rolled in peace. And as they stand there, Moses reminds them and tells them how their parents were shaken to the core and how they had promised to follow the words of God. They didn't. And now his call to them This command to these that are about to enter into the promised land, about to receive this promise that God has given. He says to them once again, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There was a multitude of gods back in Egypt. If you read the account of the Exodus, Some of those gods got carried along. Got some people in trouble. They've encountered people, especially in the latter years of their time in Exodus, in the wandering of the Exodus, that they encountered people that had all sorts of idols that they worshipped. And they're about to enter into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It's flowing with abundance. They have been in the desert for 40 years, and they're going to go where there is where there are vineyards and gardens where there's animals and green (laughs) and it's his caution to remember to recall to know the Lord God God and he has no equal there is no other He alone is God. Folks, that hasn't changed. You can fly forward 4,000 years, but it hasn't changed. It's still true. The Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And then there's that call to love him. And I just summed it up with your all. With your heart, your soul, your strength. Love him. Know him. Walk in relationship with him. See, one thing, if you go back and read, Moses says God had desired Israel to let him speak to them in person, but they refused. And that hasn't changed, friends. God still wants that personal relationship, that he loves us. Turn to your neighbor and tell them God loves you. Right now, do it. Now turn to the other neighbor. Does you want to leave my way out? Tell him, God loves you. Did you hear that? What? God what? He loves you. He does. The question is, do you love him? Because his love is not dependent upon you. It's upon him. But what he desires of us is to willingly enter into this personal relationship. Thank you, Brian, for sharing. I had no idea you were going to do that, but it fits so well. Oh, it's that relationship that we enter into. He invites, come. But we have to accept the invitation. We have to step into that relationship and then love him and experience him, to revere him, to know him with everything we have. Not just part of what we have. May I meddle? Okay, thank you. A couple people are okay with that. Everybody else is like, I just don't know where this is going. Where's he going to meddle? Well, you know, um, relationship with Jesus is more than 11 to 12 on Sunday morning. It's more than 9.45 to 12 on Sunday. It's more than Monday night, 6 to 7.30, if you're a teenager. It's more than 5.30 to 6.30 if you're one of the kids on Wednesday. It's more than 6.30 to 7.30 or so whenever the preacher gets done talking on Wednesday night for Bible study. You hear what I'm saying? It's not these compartmental pieces of life where, okay, God, I've shown up. I've got my Sunday best on. I've got a smile even. It's every moment of every day of every life that he is God 
And we're to engage him and to love him and be in relationship with him. And so Moses says to them, love God. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. By the way, I love the Hebrew. It means exceedingly, by the way, whatever that is. Strength, everything, all you've got. And then verse 6 is so important. Because friends, knowing this is not enough. There's a lot of people who know it. That's not what God called us to be, scholars. I don't see that in Scripture. We're not called to be scholars. We're not called to be experts of the law. We're not called to be experts of the Word. We're not called, thank you. I was going to trip over that. We're not supposed to be just knowing all the answers to the Bible trivia so we win. No. We're to allow this Word, these commands, the truth of who God is, and there's relationship he wants us to realize and understand and experience needs to be where? Heat sheet up there. In our hearts, which is 18 inches from here to here. Got to move. It can't just be a lot of intellectual knowledge that we can spew back out because that's as far as it ever gets. But when it sifts to our hearts, man, that's a whole other story. It'll move us. It'll change us. It'll cause us to be radical in how we live. Because we realize there's a God that loves us with an eternal, everlasting love with no end. And when it's in us, watch out. Because it can't stay in. It bubbles out and pours forth. And while we have adversity in life, it shakes us up. I took a cup of something up here and shook it real good. With the open top, it's going to be everywhere, right? Jeannie would be upset with me for making a big mess. She's shaking her head very hard. Yep. See, that's what happens when we get filled with Jesus to the brim. It's just, it can't stay in there. It's got to come out. So if we hid that in our hearts, then it's going to start impacting those around us. And the most important individuals it can impact is who are children. Because what we have now, Moses says to the people, what you're experiencing with God, do not let it end with you. Don't let you be the last generation. There is one coming, and you must what? Impress it upon the hearts of your children. Help them to know it, but help them to live it. Help them to engage and to follow and experience to impress this truth. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O people of God. The Lord God is one. And be in relationship with him with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind with everything you've got. Pass the baton. Faith on. Because, friends, you've got to pass the baton. We've got to hand it off to the next generation. It's not enough to set it there and to tell the generation, there it is, you need this. Because if it's just sitting there, and it may be in full view of the world, but if it's just sitting there, it's not going to get passed on. We can talk about the importance of a relationship. We can sing about it to the heart's extent. But if that's as far as it goes, only what we have, it's like that baton sitting there. Is that baton going to go anywhere except right there? Go anywhere. The baton has to be taken. And it has to be used. Well, how do you use this thing? I have no experience in this, folks. I am beyond my experience. I've never run a relay. I've watched them in total amazement. But when someone runs a relay, they take this baton and it's gripped, right? And they take off with all their might. They 
just explode out of the blocks. And they run down with such speed, it's unbelievable, pacing themselves back and forth and back and forth. And the guy that's the next leg, what's he doing? Or the gal that's the next leg, what they're doing? They start running when they see them coming. And they get in sync so this right hand can pass to the left hand of the next person. And they pass it off. And the next person runs again with a grip with all their might because the last thing they want to do is what? Drop it. It's got to go on to the next generation. And as they see them coming, they start running, they start, and the pass off happens again to the right. And they run and run and run, and the last leg runs a lot until what? They win. What Moses says, we must pass this baton of faith on. One generation to the next. Why? Because that's what God has determined to happen. He could send his angels to announce it. Sometimes I think the church today thinks that's what's happening. Somehow he'll get it out there. Just don't uh, disturb my life rule, honey. Make it too inconvenient. Church today in America. I'm sorry, but it is. We've lost sight of the fact that we're a generation away from the loss. We're extinguished a generation ex- uh, away from extinction. That if we don't pass the baton to the next generation, it won't be gone. It'll be setting. The exchange point. Because there'll be no one to take. As I thought about that, you know what, one runner's running and they get their pattern, they get their sync, but the next runner's got to match it. Because you can't pass that baton if you're not in sync, can you? You've got to be running the exact same pacing and you've got a limited space to get it passed off. And that's true for us, folks. We only have a limited moment in people's lives that we can pass that baton on to them. And the call that Moses gives to Israel, as you're about to enter into this land flowing with milk and honey, you're going to take over homes that you didn't build. You're going to reap this year off farms and and off fields that you didn't plant. You're going to go to vineyards and pick olives and figs and dates that you didn't plant and tend. You're going to enjoy animals that you didn't raise. Don't forget... Pass on, pass on that baton of faith. When he gives them some tools, what's the first thing he says there? Talk about it. Talk about it when you're what? What's the first thing? What's it say right there? When you sit at home. What do you do when you sit at home? Unfortunately, in the 1950s in America, we lost the front porch. Because we kept b- quit building these big porches. There's a good point for them. It was good because you sat and you talked. When we sit in our homes, are we talking? Are we telling the stories? Are we telling about camp? Went to camp. Are we telling about times in church? Are we talking about that Sunday school teacher who just went the extra mile to make the word come alive, who always seemed excited. Are we telling about that old saint that we heard on their knees at the front of the church during the prayer time, say your name, because they were praying with us. We need to talk about him and this relationship with him. That's part of passing the baton, is to talk about it, retell Our story. When you are sitting at home and when you are, what's it say? Walking along the way. That implies walking together. Can't be walking at two paces. Can't be walking at two speeds. Can't be walking in two different directions. It's that walking together. Living life together. And again, what are you doing during that? 
telling the story. Telling. And when you lie down, that's part of your day. Is it the last things to leave your lips? Now, Jesus. Family altar prayer time, maybe. You're talking to Jesus. And when you rise in the morning, I really hope the first thought of your moment, your day, Jesus. It helps with the day, I'll tell you. So when you're sitting at home, when you're walking down the road, when you're going to bed, when you're right, tell the story. That's your story. And guess what? Your story includes this story, right? Because this is what I'm based upon, the truth of this. And it's also telling the story of those saints who've gone before, who have invested in us, those who passed the baton to Who passed you the baton of faith? Do your kids know? Who it was that shared with you? Do they know where it was? Do they know the circumstances? Do they know the situations? And then Moses goes on to say, after you've told and retold and retold and retold and retold and retold and retold, and and just keep going, retell, set triggers. So what's he say? Put it on your forearms, put it on your head. Everything you do and work at should be favored with that relationship. And everything you think, every decision you make, every goal you set needs to have Jesus at the center. Set up those reminders for you. And then put it on the doorposts. Write it there. Because guess what? If it's on the doorpost, you'll go buy it. Twice every day. Maybe more. You'll see it going one way. Let it be those triggers that remind you, that take you back for you. And then he says to put it where? Last part of verse 9. Write it on your, nope, verse 9. On your gates. Out on the gates. Guess what? That means others beyond your family know you're a disciple of Jesus. He's saying to Israel, let everyone who passes by your home know that you're committed to Yahweh. Let everyone know that in this house there is only one God and he is the creator of all things and he has given life and he will sustain my life and it's by his will I live. See, it's on the doorposts, but it's also on the gates. Because everyone who passed by the gates can see the reminder. Because passing the baton isn't just for children. All those God brings into. Pass the baton. Because the bottom line is, do not. Do not forget. I don't know about you, but the busier I get, the older I get, the slower my mind's becoming, I believe, it's harder to remember things. How about passwords for your computer and devices? I love our Intel people that do our Intel, our our IT stuff for our church, because every month I have to come up with a totally new password that has never been used in the system before by me. Still have to use it. Yep. Okay. Anybody struggle with that? Sure. Sure. You know. I love it when you have somebody's phone and on the back's got the password written on it because I can't remember, you know. Okay. We will, by very human nature, forget. And Moses knows that. And God knows it. And God, through Moses, says to Israel, do not 
take care not to forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. You'll remember the things you're always telling. Don't forget. And the second don't. Don't fail. Pass. a lot at stake. There is a lot at stake. We must have his word hidden in our hearts. David says in Psalm 119, so I know how to live that I might not sin against God. And I've got to be pouring that intentionally into the lives of those Take out your pen. This is homework. Okay? I'm not collecting it. So don't get all afraid if you have test anxieties. Okay? It's all right. But I'm going to ask you, if you would please, we now, Tuesday morning, window, today or sometime tomorrow, Take a little time with this piece of paper. And let it be the start to telling your story about the wonderful relationship you've got with God, our Heavenly Father. There are a few questions there just to get you started. It's not exhaustive. It's just a start. I hope you'll take time and fill this paper out and then put it somewhere. If I had been planning a little further ahead, I'd have had envelopes for all of them. And you could mail it to yourself. You'd get it back at the end of the week. But I didn't get that done. But you can still do that. Put it where you stumble across it every day. Whatever it is, that you'll see this. Put it there with your answers so you don't forget. You're hiding it in your hearts. And then... Look for ways, because the last question, who do you have to pass on your faith? Generation, generation, generation. To pass on the truth of God's word. In just a moment, we're going to sing another camp song. It's one of those old ones from my era. But it's a good one. And in it, I want you not just to sing the song real quick, because it's easy just to sing songs, but not think about the words. Think about the words, and I will give you an excuse not to sing if you need to, just to really think about what those words are saying. Because let it be your declaration today that you'll pass it on. Because the first thing that tells us is it only takes what? A spark to get a fire going. My prayer is that this little exercise will be a spark to get your fire going. That you'll have God's Spirit to strengthen and well up and inspire you so you can't be silent about this faith. Because we are called, we are called to pass. And during the song, it is our invitation. Let me give you this invitation. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as Brian transparently shared this morning, and I appreciate that so much. God's in good things, because I had no idea what he was going to do, and that was just great. It's not about being a member of the church or attending church on a regular basis. This is about a personal walk with Jesus. You don't have that. Don't go from this place without it today. Jesus is inviting you to receive him. He wants you to know him like he knows you. He wants you to know his love so you can love him. You've not made that choice. Today is the day you've done that. Brothers and sisters, the invitation is always a time for us. Maybe we've let things of the world distract us and get us confused and our eyes focused on the wrong things 
That's what Satan really likes to do, get us busy over little things over here and rather than on the goal. Our eyes aren't on the finish line. It's time to come and pray. I'm glad to pray with you. There are a board of servants here that will come forward and pray with you if you come to it. God's saying, I want you to be a, I want to be a part of this church family. Always the invitation from us to come. God speaks in this time. Hear his voice. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this message. We thank you for this opportunity to pass on our faith. And Lord, I ask this morning that as we sing this song, that it would be a time that you use to invite us in your presence. Let the words not be familiar to the point that we sing them without thinking. And may they be the prayer of our hearts today. May they be the confession of our lives to you. May it be our goal to pass on this relationship we have. Lord, thank you for Moses' words to Israel that day. Thank you for recording them. Thank you that through them we can know how you're calling us to follow you. Help us to follow Help us to share. Have your will and way in our lives during this song. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand. It only takes a spark to get a fire Soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you'll spread His love to everyone you want to pass it. time is spring when all the trees are budding. The birds begin to sing, the flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, sing. It's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on him. It matters not where you Shout it from the mountain top. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want my world to know. Has come to me. I want to pass it on. We do have a luncheon, and so in just a moment, as we dismiss, I invite you to make your way down to the Great Hall. I am sure there will be plenty for everyone, so please stay. Even if your plans were different, if you can change them, please come and join us for that time. In the Great Hall, there's going to be a table set up, and Mark's going to be there. You're going to let him get his meal first, but then he'll be there where you can do registration forms, and there's a health form that has to be notarized, and we are blessed that he's a notary, and so he can do that for us, and so we'll be doing that. Also, during the luncheon, Brian's going to be sharing some of his original music, and so I hope that you'll just stay and enjoy that time as well.
Uh, So as we move from this place, I hope that you'll just be a part of that time that we share and continue in fellowship around the table. And let it be the start of a chance to maybe tell your story, at least a little piece of your story with those you have lunch with today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your rich blessings. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its instruction. We thank you that it's a guide for our lives each and every day. Lord, may we take a time each day and be intentional to be in your word and allow it to take hold of our lives, just to submit ourselves to your spirit and to the teaching as he brings its truth and applies it. And then, Lord, may we go out being that light that shines, that word that shares the testimony about you. Lord, may you bless us as a fellowship of believers, as a church family, and allow us, Lord, to be impacting the community where you've placed us here on the west side and throughout the area. Lord, I ask your blessing on the meal we're about to share. May the food be nourishment to our bodies. May the fellowship around the tables encourage our spirits. And may you bless Brian as he'll be sharing some music during the time to just continue to inspire us as we talk with you. Lord, we do thank you for your abundant blessing. And we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Come join us for lunch.